Um, all righty. So first and foremost, uh, I made some changes to how the labs work. Uh, so please read the chaos post. Um, if you had a question about lab two, I assumed that this post answers them all. If you feel like I didn't answer it for whatever reason, I just missed it, you wanted a clarification or whatever, just please post another piazza question. We're not going to go through and visually answer them. So uh, any questions about that? Okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, for, the, or what I'm considering is uh, the midterm at present is supposed to be in this lecture hall. It is unpleasant at best to do it that way. So I think I'm going to move it to the discussion section of that same week. So you'll have it in the class because I think all of you are on CDS, right? Um, so, uh, in, and it'll be a little bit more reasonable there. Uh, so I'm gonna try to move the midterm to then. So whatever on the syllabus will be that Friday. I'll, I'll update the syllabus when I update it with these details uh, and we'll hopefully post it tonight. But to keep it back in your mind, it won't be the, the day it's on, it will be, the Friday, it's basically the Friday, I think, right before spring break. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it once you're on spring break. Mm -hmm. it open uh, we'll see. Um, so traditionally, uh, the one thing I can promise is that I don't understand ever having an exam that requires programming, having to do that either by hand, like on paper, or like filling in a document kind of thing. So the only kind of questions that would be um, so that would definitely be on a computer. So it'll be on a computer and over. If it's on a computer, it's very, very hard for me to keep you from looking at the entire internet. So generally speaking, the programming portion will be what, what I usually refer to as open web. Okay, so you can use whatever you want on the internet. Uh, I do usually limit it to single screen though. So in other words, you can use your laptop or your iPad or whatever it is you want to use to take the exam, but you can't use any other devices. Does that make sense? Like you can't also have your phone on. Uh, I just don't want to get an advantage to people who have like 37 different devices like me. Um, so that's one. And but there will be some closed portion as well. Um, and it may ask, like, you know, what uh you know, what is the uh you know object we use to read CSV files? The answer being table. So it it might have a couple of very important things that you use from programming, but it won't be like writing code. Next, um, but uh, I didn't. I didn't love the midterm last semester, so I might be making changes to it. So I don't want to use too much promise beforehand. Yeah. Sure, well, you can turn the lights off. For oh yeah, I forgot. Right. Right. Good. Yeah. Uh, all right. Moving on. And look, we start with a question. So what function adds a column to a table? I feel like this was already a top hat hop, hop, hop question, um, but you know, repetition is, I don't know, gold? Chicken? Gold. Well, I don't think I'm in the frame. I'll be again. No. Uh, for top hat, okay, we're not using that for a so. All right, everybody get your answers in. So, oh, forgot to turn my back on. Uh, everyone get your answers in. Thank you. All right, three, two, one. So pretty good. So it's with columns or with column uh, is the way you add stuff to a table. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is attribute types or attribute types, depending on how you like to pronounce that first word. Um, we talked about this a little bit already, uh, but here's kind of the, the wider, uh, you know, explanation. So there's basically two big kinds. One is called numerical, which we're going to talk about first, and one is called categorical. Uh, 
Uh, so a numerical attribute is, as you might imagine, is a number. Okay. So it means that it is like countable and sortable as a number. Okay. So this might be like grades. Okay. Are a number. Um, and as a result, are you know, so differences are meaningful. So like you can subtract one from the other and it'll it'll mean something. Okay. Um, and they're generally considered ordered somehow. Okay. So that there is a concept of ascending and descending when we talk about numerical measures. Um, you have other kinds of ascending and descending as well, but you know, kind of they're they're kind of manufactured. So for example, like if you uh, alphabetize a list of names. Um, you consider that like an order, but it's not an order because it's a number, right? So think about it in terms of they, they're three actual numbers, okay? Um, and the reason this is important is because you can do certain things with numerical attributes that you can't do with categorical, which is the other one, and vice versa. And if you try to apply a technique that works on numerical on categorical, you will get weird results. So that's what's hard about it is that you get weird answers instead of like wrong, right? So you might even do a test or something, and you know, your first five attempts actually come up with the correct answer, but then the sixth one is weird, right? Like, so that's where you want to be careful of making sure that you know which category, which type it is, sorry, which attribute type it is, which of these were categories. All right, so this is the uh, numerical attributes, uh, but then we also have categorical attributes. So this is where it gets a little bit more deceiving. So it comes from a, what's called a fixed inventory. So there is theoretically a list of all possible values, right? Whereas with numbers, there is no poss all possible value, right? It, it goes infinitely in every direct, in both directions. So you don't, there's no end. So there's no limit when you talk about numbers. Okay, but with the category, there's a limit, even if they are numbers. And this is where it gets confusing. So your BUID, for example, is a number, but it is a categorical attribute. Ordering a list of BUIDs in numerical order theoretically doesn't tell you anything. It probably tells you when they entered the school, right? But no guarantees. Another good example is social security numbers, okay? Also numbers, but are categorical because the the numbers don't kind of really mean anything. Although if you're interested, social security numbers, uh, how many people here, has everybody get a social security number? If you're a student here, I can't remember. Okay, so social security numbers are three digits, two digits, four digits. And the three digits actually represent the hospital you were born in. Um, and, uh, and if you are like me, um, if you were born abroad, uh, it's the, uh, it's the, kind of registered hospital for where you came into the country. Um, I have a suspicion that I know what this stupid noise is. Okay, let's see if that makes it better. All right, crossing fingers that that makes you go away. Uh, so, so let's carry numbers. First three digits are actually the hospital you were born in. Uh, wait, no, first three digits are the are the state you were born in. My bad, uh, but they're the set of them. Second two digits are the hospital you were born in, and then the last one's just a counter. Uh, so it just loops. So as you might imagine, what might happen there pretty quickly? Anyway, oh sorry. You run out of numbers to people. Right. So you loop pretty fast, right? So you get duplicates really quickly. Anybody know why that might be? Does anybody ever read the book 1984? Right. 1984, uh, very focused on the government, you know, uh, you know, watching your every move. Um, that book and the social security number uh like concept came out in similar time frame, 1984 came out beforehand, and people freaked out when they said, every American is gonna get a number. This sounds a lot like 1984. Uh, and so when they initially rolled them out, they said, there's no guarantee of uniqueness. Okay, so in other words, people get dupes all the time. 
However, 10 years later, 15 years later, what do you think started to happen? People put in their social security number and thought it was somebody else. Or yeah, basically people started expecting it to be me, right? Uh, and so I don't know when it was exactly, but somewhere in the last, I want to say like 20 years or so, um, they have actually tried very hard to make it unique. So when I was actually in high school, there was a person in Texas who had my social security number, and there was a petition process you could go and get your number changed. But obviously, neither one of us wants to get our social security number changed. We've already memorized it. We use it all over the place, right? Uh, so conveniently, he died. Yeah. I thought he was very old, but so I never had to get a chance. But uh, it, it happens. It happens regularly and happens less often now. Uh, but it does still happen, and you'll still see people occasionally get essentially ID fraud uh, because there happens to be a collision on social security numbers. So, yeah. So my uh, my terrible story later. Um, but uh, yeah, so I ended up having a unique ID, uh, and I was particularly likely to get one because I was born abroad and so I was brought in this special category that has a relatively small number of, of options rather than you know like technically I had a California social security number um and you know but all the ones who are born abroad get it from the same block as if it was the same hospital. All right so uh this kind of gets to the same idea just because a numerical attribute, oh, sorry, the other big, huge example we see all the time in US data is zip codes. Okay, so particularly if you live around here, uh, most of our zip code lead with a zero, right? If you drop that zero, it becomes an invalid zip code, right? And, but normally if you have the number like zero, one, two, right, the 12 is the same as zero, one, two. But with zip codes, one of the ways you know it's a categorical pipe is because if that leading zero matters. Okay, so actually, that slides out of order. That shouldn't be there yet. We won't talk about this, but we can talk about this question. All right, so which type of attribute comes from a fixed inventory, numerical or categorical? Maybe I just I can just like disable the entire sound card in the fourth class. I don't know why it makes so much. All right. So answered in. I think there's another question in a second, but it might be later. All right, so, oh boy, uh, no, sorry. So the correct answer uh, was uh, categorical. Looked like most of you got it, but I jumped past the screen too fast. And I don't want to give it back, it's actually very difficult. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about the US census, okay? So uh, this is a word I have a very hard time with, but I think it's the Seattle, the Seattle, nope, can't do it. Uh, but you can read it to yourselves. Um, but it basically means every 10 years. Um, and so in the US Constitution, it says that there will every 10 years be a counting of the people. Um, and the reason for this is because the way the US has, so how many people here think the US is a democracy? You know it's a leading question. It is not a democracy. It is what's called a representative democracy, uh, because if it was a democracy, like certain state uh, city states in ancient Greece, uh, everyone would have a vote. Okay. Now, even in ancient Greece, everyone, of course, meant property owners and you know people who had land. You know, but whatever. So, 
Uh, in the US, uh, we actually have representative democracy, which means that instead of us having a vote on every issue, on every law, we vote to have somebody who is going to do as their job the voting on every issue and every law. Okay. So, in order to figure out what that representation should be, uh, they use this census and they calculate, or they actually count all the people in the country and use that to figure out, uh, you know, how many state reps, at, well, at the state level, it's also done, but House of Reps, uh, so at the federal level. Um, and then also, like, uh, the Senate is actually just two for every state, um, you know, but there's an electoral college called, like, if you want to get into political science, feel free to learn more about it. My mother's a political science professor, so I inherited a lot of that knowledge. Um, but they also estimate it every year because the census data, and the reason I bring it up in this class is because census data is used in so much uh, data science experiments. So basically, if you want a good, you know, set of people to do some, you know, some data science with, the U.S. Census is really good. It's very consistent. Um, it's been going on for 200 years, uh, and they've actually tried very hard to make sure that when you say take the data, say from 2010 and compare it to 1990, you can do an apples to apples comparison. Okay, so as you might imagine, right, you're doing something like a census. You're actually collecting more data than does someone exist, right? You might be collecting gender, you might be collecting uh, household income, you know, etc. Uh, so, what what you want to be able to do though is you want to be, if you want to see a trend, you need to know that you're measuring, say, gender the same way in 1990 as you are in 2010. Does that make sense? As a result, well, not entirely as a result. Let me start here. So. The thing is about the census is that, especially because it's been around for so long, um, you want mechanisms to kind of be able to collapse your data as much as you can. So they use these tricks. So for example, the sex data is zero, or sorry, one is male and two is female, okay? And whereas the sex column, if you see a zero, that means that that data is for the total of both men and women, okay? so. As a result, they kind of embedded more information in that column than should be there. Okay. It has the trade off of limiting flexibility. Okay. So you can't just arbitrarily add new, you know, sex values to uh, the data set. Um, you know, age is kind of in the same way. So it captures, uh, you know, people who live there as age, but 999 is the total of all ages. So if we ever get to the point where humans are living to a thousand years old, that's going to be a problem, right? So this is why it's a dangerous thing to kind of embed extra data in your column. But the trade-off is it's much more efficient, right? So you don't have to have a special table or a special column that indicates like the total value. So you can just kind of layer it in just like everything else. Does that make sense? So this is a very common practice in lots of data sets of any kind. So you just need to be really cautious that you're kind of looking at the data correctly, right? So it's very easy to assume, for example, I think the sex example is a really good one, that zero is like unknown, right? Because that seems plausible as zero, but that's not what it means. It actually basically means the opposite of that, right? So be really careful that you're, you're making, you know, you either validate your assumptions or you don't make assumptions, you look it up, but assuming what those values might mean can be really dangerous if you don't actually go and check it out, okay? And this also brings up that history problem of, you know, you pull out the census data from 1980, you wanna be sure that the zero there still means all, right? Or 2010 still means all before you try to compare them. So it's just something to think about. Um, and again, uh, these would be categorical, they also tend to represent things as numeric values, so like zero, one, and two, because they take up less room, okay? both on paper, but also in a computer. So you don't have to have, you know, because you imagine the census data for the US, which last night it was like three or 400 million people, is quite a lot of data. So anything you can do to save data or save space, the better. So actually having not having male and female written out, it's a lot less room. 
Um, let's see. And one thing to just kind of point out when you're looking at this data, we're going to see it in a second, uh, and we'll use it again over the semester. But they have kind of pretty guessable column names. But again, a lot of the time you want to go and check and make sure that the guess you're making is correct. So this is population estimate 2010. That is actually the 2010 estimate. Like that's the data. Okay. Um, but as I said in the, I think the prior slide, they actually go out and do some guesswork for to try to get the nine every 10 year census. So basically the US government can't afford to do a census any more often than 10 years. Arguably, it can't even do it every 10 years. Like it's a very expensive activity. So they use other mechanisms to try to guess what it is in like 2011 and 2012, because you want to know what all those years are, but you can't afford to do a proper census. So there's a bunch of trick in that. Uh, if you're really interested in the census, we almost every semester do a workshop as part of Spark, uh, where we explain how the census works and all the crazy data that's available. Um, sorry, before we get to the question, one other thing about this particular data is that uh, because it's being done by the federal government, um, there are certain, basically by default, things that are created by government entities in the US at least are public. So as a result, you should have access to all of this data. So the thing where it gets a little dicey is you know, privacy protection, right? You don't necessarily need to know that this person's name is this age at this particular address. So they'll take some of that data out, but you can get access to most data from the US. If it's privileged, do you actually have a concept called a FOIA? Uh, which is actually a Freedom of Information Act request where you can basically request data that you think should be public. Um, and then, you know, obviously you get into stuff that is meant to be secret. But All right. So we should have explained all this. So this is just the mapping. Um, and I think it may or may not show up this way for you, but you just match the numbers of others. Right, get those answers in. All right, let's move on. All right. So these are the correct answers, I think. No, these are the responses. These are the correct answers. Um, so one map to B and two map to D and three map to E and four map to C. Um, did it tell you if you got it right? No, that's in the way. All right, well, this is the right answer. I uh, hope you remember what you put in. Uh, so just recapping kind of most of it I just said, um, it's I sometimes will put a slide in this like this to make sure I remember to say all the things. Um, but, you know, so numeric codes are often used for storage efficiency. Uh, it can be really dangerous. You just want to be really careful that you're using them correctly. And values in a column have the same type that are not necessarily comparable. Okay, and that's that kind of key. So age 12, you can't compare to age 999 if you want to look at two different ages. You can say what percentage of the population is 12 using those two, but you can't say, you know, like you could with 12 and 13. <laughs> okay.
All right. So, whoops. So this is, um, you know, looks essentially like uh, a census data table. Um, it's obviously cut down from the data set size of what is available. It's kind of like a summary table. So it just kind of gives totals. Um, you can, like I said, you can get a lot more detail, you can get a lot more data, but for like us and this class, um, you know, we use something a little simpler, you know, this is only, you know, just about 300 rows, uh, so we can kind of manipulate it quickly and easily. Um, the thing about data science, I kind of said this in the first lecture, is that typically when you're doing the work that we're talking about, if you weren't in a class, you were doing it in the real world, it'll be 100,000 records. A million records. And as you can imagine, that gets expensive, right? From a performance or like whatever you're trying to do. Uh, and so in this class, we use small sample data sets to kind of teach you how to do it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, actually, late in the semester, I'll show you much bigger data sets. Um, you know, like I tend to like to play with, you all know what blue bikes are. <clears throat> so the blue bikes data of usage is all published in public. By the city of Boston. And so I'm going to use those for examples. But the data sets, even one of the ones I use in one of the assignments is cut down. Um, and it's it's way cut down, and it's only 300,000 rows, right? And that's it's like a month of data. So okay, so if we wanted to compare the total number of men, women, and both for real data. 2010 and estimated from 2014, what would we do? And let me switch to my cheat sheet so that I don't make stupid mistakes. All right, does anybody have any ideas for what to put in for this? So remember our census data right now is called full. Um, and if I wanted to get a new table so that I could do this comparison, what do you think I would do? Or what should I do to make it a little easier? Any ideas? All right, we'll kind of just kind of go into it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to pare it down because it's kind of the problem I was just talking about. I'm going to pare it down to just the data I care about, right? So that I can do. Oh, you I strongly encourage cutting and pasting for this kind of thing from above. So I don't know if I typed that right, but so if you notice the pattern on the column names, so census 2010 pop, that is an actual count. 2010 was one of the censuses. So we just had 2020. Um, the data is actually released now. I could switch this up, but you know, whatever, it doesn't make that much difference. And then there's the population estimate from 2014. Okay, so that's an estimate based on basically doing a small, smallish survey uh, and the existing data from 2010, basically doing math and magic to hopefully come up with a good estimate. All right, so now I have. Or should have, assuming I said that incorrectly. Now I have a table that just has those columns. And what I want to do is I want to pare it down so that I have less data to work with when I want to get to the real parts of the of the work. So the first thing I might want to do is make it clear what the different things are. So this is the kind of thing where it's super handy for you to remember to do this, but it's not strictly necessary most of the time. So what we do is I'm going to call it simple, just to be consistent with my uh, cheat sheet. 